So this happened to me when I was six years old. It was my first paranormal experience, and it truly sounds like a badly thought up one. But let me assure you that it was by far the most traumatic. Nothing I have experienced since has topped this encounter. Back in 1999, I lived in Midland, Texas. My brother and I had been playing in the living room during a really bad thunderstorm at night. I have no idea where our three younger siblings were, asleep I'm guessing. My mother was in the kitchen washing dishes and singing. As we were playing and running around, I had forgotten that I had homework to do. I told my mom I needed to get my backpack out of the car and headed to the door that went into the garage directly behind her. She just nodded and kept singing her songs and told me to be sure to close the door behind me. I said okay and headed into the garage. As soon as I shut the door behind me, I got this sudden rush of fear. It was raining really hard and the thunder and lightning echoed in our garage. So I'm six, I'm in the garage alone and it's dark outside, so of course any kid would be scared. Logical, right? Our garage was an automatic garage and had windows at the top. I kept my eyes facing our car because I was afraid I'd see a monster if I looked out the windows. I opened the car door, hopped in, and started making my way to the very back of the car to grab my purple Pocahontas backpack. As I was making my way, the fear I was feeling intensified, and the atmosphere started to feel really uneasy, like I was in danger. It's weird and hard to explain, but it seemed like every second that passed, the uneasiness grew. I kept my eyes looking down, grabbed my backpack, and started to pick up the pace to get off the car and get back in the house. I hopped off, slammed the door shut, and started speed walking to the door. Right as I was about to grasp the door handle and made it back to my sanctuary, there was a knock behind me. I panicked, and I don't know why, but I turned to see who was there. It was my dad. Let me give you a little backstory of my dad. At the time, he used to be a truck driver and would be gone weeks at a time and home for a few days because he was a workaholic. So all we would do was have short phone conversations with him because it was back when you had to buy minutes and it was expensive. When he would come home, it was always hugs and kisses when we saw each other and lots of I love yous. He may have been gone a lot, but when he was home he was an awesome dad and would take us everywhere, our favorite place being Discovery Zone. He would chase us through the tunnels and ball pits. When he would arrive home, we would go to pick him up at the truck stops. He always had his sunglasses on and his army bag over his shoulder, holding it by the straps. This is exactly who I saw standing on the other side of the garage window. My dad, with sunglasses on and his right hand holding the straps of what I assumed to be his army bag of clothes. I let out a sigh of relief. Oh, it's just that, I thought to myself, and the biggest grin came across my face. The atmosphere remained the same, but when I saw my dad, the fear eased. But he didn't smile at me like he usually did after being away from home for a long time, and he didn't speak. He looked emotionless. He then began pointing with his left hand. No smile, no emotion, only pointing to something. I started looking for what it was. I pointed to a box on the floor. This box? I asked. He shook his head as if to say no and kept pointing. I pointed to several other things and he patiently motioned to no once again. I finally looked up above me beside the door behind me. The green glowing button, the one to open the garage. I pointed to the button and looked at him. The button? I asked. He nodded his head in approval and motioned for me to push the button. I was about to do it, and suddenly the feeling of danger and fear came back even more overwhelming than the first time. Something was wrong, really wrong. A voice in my head told me to not open the garage. I looked at Dad, so afraid I couldn't speak anymore. I shook my head, declining to push the button. He motioned again, this time aggressively. I declined again and this time my eyes started to water up. He then put his pointing hand down and stared at me for what felt like forever. His expression changed from apathetic to angry. He just stared at me and I stared back, paralyzed with fear. Then he lifted his hand back up, but it wasn't a hand anymore. They looked like claws. I remember him scratching the window and hearing it screech like nails on a chalkboard. I was finally able to snap out of my paralyzed state to run inside. All I remember next is sitting on the couch, just sitting there, traumatized. 
My brother knew something was up because I had been all giggles with him earlier. He grabbed my shoulder and gave it a light shake. What's wrong, Vanessa? I don't even think he got to finish that question before I started screaming my head off and having a panic attack. My mother dropped what was in her hand and came running to my screams of bloody terror. My brother gave my mom a I didn't do it look and she bent down beside me and asked what was wrong. I could barely speak through my sobbing. All I could say was, Daddy is scaring me. She couldn't understand what I was trying to say and asked where. I pointed to the garage and she stormed off in that direction. She came back like 15 seconds later saying that there was no one there. After I was able to calm down, I told her what had happened and started the sobbing process all over again since I was reliving the moment as I spoke. She called my dad. He was 435 miles away in Houston, Texas. Nowhere near us. They spoke for a bit and she handed me the phone. My dad prayed with me and told me to never be afraid and to just call upon Jesus to help me and that the bad things wouldn't bother me again. I slept with my mom that night. And here's the disturbing part. The next morning, she went to check out the garage. The claw marks were on the window. I think before she thought it was just my imagination, until the scratches proved it to be reality. We've moved lots of times since and now live in a different city. I'm 25 now and I haven't been able to go into the garage at night alone until a few years ago. It still scares me to think about that night. I still have all these unanswered questions. Why was it wearing sunglasses at night? Why did it happen to me? And the scariest question I asked myself, what if I had opened the garage? What would have happened? In 2012, I went through a very rough breakup with my boyfriend of around 18 months. You know that old saying, you live by the sword, you die by the sword? Well, our relationship was like that, only instead of a sword, there was a lot of drugs and alcohol. He was a party animal, and at first, I found that very attractive. But after almost two years of fighting and struggling for money while nursing hangovers, I realized that I wanted to mellow out while he didn't want anything of the sort. I didn't want to be that lame, controlling girlfriend. I wanted him to live the kind of life that felt right. I just wasn't going to let us slowly drift apart when we'd be much happier pursuing relationship goals with alternative partners. And that's the way I saw things anyway, but he disagreed. Like I said, the breakup itself was rough. There was yelling, there was tears, but in the end, he seemed to accept my decision and agreed that we'd be happier seeing other people. I also explained that I wanted to end things on a high note and that I didn't want my final memories of him to be tarnished by anything negative. That's what really seemed to make it through to him, and after that, everything seemed fine. But then came the night that he drove over to complete the ceremonial exchanging of stuff. I'm pretty sure that a lot of you know what I'm talking about. If you've been seeing someone long enough to have frequent sleepovers at each other's places, chances are you've left a whole bunch of stuff over there. For example... A bunch of skincare stuff to keep in his bathroom so I didn't have to carry a makeup bag to and from his place. Then, factor in that I have to buy this expensive Korean skin cream that literally has snail slime in it, look it up, and you can see why I was so desperate to get it back. Now anyway, so I've been texting my ex back and forth for a few days, organizing the exchange, making sure we're not forgetting anything so it's a one-time thing and we can make a clean break. He agrees to come over to my place once we'd both finished work. Then when I got home, I bagged up all of his stuff and waited for him to arrive. He told me that he'd be at my place by no later than 7. But then 7 turns to 7.30 and there's no sign of him. I text him to ask where he was but got no reply, so maybe like 5 to 10 minutes later I start calling him and after getting his voicemail a few times, he finally picks up. He didn't sound like he was in a particularly good mood, but all that indicated to me was that he was sober. He told me that he'd gotten caught up in a few things and that he'd be over by around 8.15. All I did was ask him not to be too late, as I had to work the next morning. He hung up, and then I went back to waiting. Finally, just before 9, 
He buzzes my apartment, and I let him upstairs while I waited near the door with his bag of stuff. It took him slightly longer than usual to make it to my door, but then when he does, and I open it, I could smell the stink of booze on him, and right away that gave me bad vibes. He had a shopping bag with what looked like my stuff in it, so that was a good sign, but I had also explicitly asked him to stay sober for the exchange because I knew what it might lead to. I say I knew what it might lead to, but that's not strictly true. I figured it'd get emotional. I'd just never have guessed that he'd take things as far as he did. So first thing I say when I opened the door and smelled the booze on him was a reminder that he'd promised to make the exchange sober. He just brushed it off, asked if he could come inside, but I said no, that I'd prefer just make the exchange and leave things at that. He started asking me, really, this is who you are now? And I very politely reminded him that if he couldn't conduct himself like a grown-up, then he wouldn't be getting his stuff. It was a huge bluff on my part because I really wanted my stuff back, but I also didn't want to give him the impression that he could keep dictating terms outside of our relationship. I remember taking a step back from the door and getting ready to close it, then after giving him one last chance to just give me my stuff back, I attempted to gently close the door in his face. His response was to shove his foot in the door to keep it from closing. And then after barging it open so hard it actually frightened me, he walked down the hallway of my apartment and into the TV and kitchenette area. My apartment door was still wide open as I started yelling at him like, what the F do you think you're doing? Get out of here. But he didn't listen. He just marched into my kitchenette area where there was a small dining table, then slammed the bag of my stuff down on it. Then as he took a seat, he demanded that I come talk to him about the breakup so he could get some final closure, as he called it. I held firm, refused to even follow him into the kitchen, and kept demanding that he leave before I called the cops. But that's when he seemed to completely lose his mind and started literally screaming at the top of his lungs. Do you want to kill me? Because that's what you're doing here. You're killing me. By the time he started freaking out and screaming, I was already on the cusp of dialing 911. But when he walked over to my knife block and pulled out the biggest one he could find, I realized things were way beyond negotiating and hit call after tapping 911. I also rushed back towards the front door to my apartment for several different reasons. First off, I had a pepper spray in my jacket that I kept on the hanger, like out of sight in case I needed to use it on an intruder, and so the first thing I did was grab that. But now I'm outside my apartment in the hallway with the door wide open and my ex sitting at the kitchen table, so if I need to, I can run down the hallway and out of the building and not risk trapping myself in the apartment with him. I'm also talking to the 911 operator by then too, all the while my ex is screaming at me to get off the phone and come back inside. But since he still had that carving knife and a white knuckle grip, there was exactly 0% chance of me heading back inside. The next thing, I was giving the operator the address of my apartment building when my ex started walking toward me, out of the kitchen and into the hallway. I obviously wanted to keep out of stabbing range, so to speak, so I remember rushing down the hallway toward the elevator and stairs and stopping to check if he was following me. My ex was following me. He'd come out of my apartment and into the hallway, but when I turned around in that split second and he saw that he had my attention, he stopped walking, turned the knife, and started to stab himself in the stomach. It looked like the knife was going deep, but not all of it went into his stomach every time he stabbed. I guess it was like lots of quick shallow stabs, but from the horrible sound it was making, I could tell he was really hurting himself. I think that lasted maybe a second or two. I saw him doing it really, really fast, then I just turned and ran screaming down the stairwell instead of taking the elevator. He didn't shout anything after me, or if he did, I didn't hear it, all I could hear was those grunts of pain as he stabbed himself again, and again, and again. Then I started screaming, and I didn't hear anything else after that. I remember taking my phone away from my ear as I ran down the stairs because it felt like I might lose my balance if I didn't. But then, I was so scared that I kept trying to tell the operator what was going on, 
and that resulted in me running down the stairs screaming, he's stabbing himself, he's stabbing himself, someone call an ambulance, he's stabbing himself. I ran all the way across the parking lot of my apartment building before bringing the phone back to my ear and I kept talking to her as I waited by the street that I knew the cops would come down. I remember begging the operator to tell the EMTs to hurry, that my ex was really hurting himself to the point where I thought he might die. She did her best to try and keep calm, then the next thing I knew, I saw the cop car and I started frantically waving at them to flag them down. One of the other things I remember is how as I let the cops into the building with my key fob, I kept telling them, please don't shoot him, he's trying to hurt himself, so please don't shoot him. The cops completely ignored me, I guess because they were focused on their job, but in the moment, their silence had me even more panicked thinking, oh god, he's still going to be holding that knife and he's not going to drop it and they're going to kill my ex-boyfriend right there in the hallway outside my apartment. They didn't shoot him, thankfully. He was just lying there bleeding, but by the time the EMTs arrived and got him into the ambulance, which was at least an hour after he stabbed himself, I was totally convinced that he was going to die. Thankfully, some of my neighbors had emerged from their own apartments to see what all the commotion was and were there to give me the consolation I so direly needed in that moment. Another thing to be thankful for was that my ex survived his self-inflicted wounds although he did need a bunch of different surgeries to repair all the damage he'd done to his stomach or intestines. I thought the whole experience might sober him up, but the last I heard, he'd gone right back to his old self after maybe a year on the wagon. It's a shame, really. The guy had a lot of potential, and I wish he'd gone and made some better choices in life. But as I said earlier, if he's living the life he wants to live, then I'm happy for him. Happy to be apart from him also, but... Happy for him, nonetheless. About two years ago, I moved into a new apartment. The walls were very thin, and because of the fire safety laws in my city, my bedroom had one window, which led into the living room, and none with outside access. The window will be important later. It was three bedrooms, one for me, one for the master tenant, and one spare, which at the time was rented out by a pretty friendly guy. Well, friendly guy had issues with his work visa and had to move back to Canada last minute, leaving us about two weeks to find another roommate. Our quickest and easiest option was Craigslist. Due to my work schedule, I had no part in the selection process, but was content when the new roommate moved in a little later. He seemed a bit off, but friendly. He was very tall, large guy, but pretty quiet and not someone I wanted to go out of my way to hang out with, but was okay to be around and be cordial with. About two weeks into his move in, the master tenant left for Hawaii, leaving him and I alone in the home for the month-long duration of his stay. For the first few days, things are normal. All of a sudden, about four days into the trip, I'm woken up at about 8am to a frantic knocking at my door. Roommate, who we'll call Kyle, is staying there when I open up, looking frazzled. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, Do you want to tell me what went on last night? To which I was shocked and confused because I had come home from work at about 9pm and immediately showered and went to bed. I explain this to him and he tells me that he heard me screaming and arguing with someone in my room. That he saw me in the side alley out the window, arguing with our landlord whom I'd never even seen at that point, that he'd heard coming in and out of our house. I tell him no way, none of that ever happened. After staring at me for a little longer, he leaves and doesn't bring it up again. The next morning I wake up to the same thing. This time he says he saw me arguing with my boyfriend. I was single at the time. He had seen me talking with our other roommate, who was in Hawaii, and asking me for the badge number of the officer I'd spoken to since he had apparently seen me talking to a bunch of police as well. This time, I get angry and more or less tell him to cut this out because I'm not doing anything and don't know what he's talking about. He gets a weird look on his face and says, I think I had a seizure in my sleep. The next time it happens, call an ambulance. And leaves for a bit, only to start knocking again about an hour later and when I open up, Kyle repeats the exact same story verbatim. 
This happens once more before I tell him to leave me alone and leave for work. I go to work as normal and I am reluctant to return that night but am too tired to switch to an alternate location. Big mistake. About 1am, I wake up to slamming doors. Kyle is pacing back and forth between his bedroom, the living room, and out the front door. Walking in and out of each room, turning the lights on and off, mumbling angrily and slamming the doors. I can see his figure pacing back and forth through the frosted window in my room that leads to the living room. Since my room is dark, he can't see inside. Suddenly he screams, I can't live like this, why are you doing this to me? I think he's on the phone and don't respond. A few moments later he screams my name repeatedly and I realize he's directing it towards me. I knew I had to get the F out of there so I very quietly creeped out of bed and started getting dressed and packing a bag of clothes for work in the morning. I'm almost done when he screams, I hear you, and charges over towards my room slapping the wall next to my door but not touching the door itself. I look towards my window and see his shadow lean all the way forward, pressing his ears against the glass. I was terrified and sat completely still, unmoving. He eventually screams my name again and moves away from the window, and I hear him start pacing between rooms again. Now, my shoes are kept on a rack outside my door and not inside my room, so I know that when I leave I'm going to need a moment to put them on. I decide to wait until his pacing takes him out of the front door again, at which time I plan to grab my shoes, put them on, and run. As I'm formulating this plan, the pacing stops. He screams, Do you want to fight about this? Come out right now and we'll fight, I swear to God. I'm a very small girl, five feet tall, and this guy is easily three times my size, so I'm definitely not looking to fight, thanks. After a few minutes, he turns off all the lights and I hear the door to his room open and close, followed by silence. I wait for a moment to be sure I can't hear any movement and then decide to take my chance. I took a breath and pull my door open quickly. I step out and grab my shoes before I look up a second later and see him standing shirtless with just a pair of boxers and socks on. In the dark of the hallway, his arms hung slightly outward in an awkward position. He says in a low, calm voice, Ma'am, we need to talk. This is a hard no for me, so I grab my shoes and run out the door with them in hand. I run about half a block barefoot before I stop to put them on. When I look back, he's standing in the porch light of our front door, watching me run but not moving. Luckily, I have a friend who lived two blocks away and I had their spare key so I let myself in and crashed there for the night. And that's why I stayed for the next week or so while we work things out with the master tenant and Kyle agreed to move out within the week. He says he doesn't remember anything that happened and wasn't sure if it was real or not. But if I said that's what went down, then it must be real. The day Kyle left, he sends me a photo of the house keys sitting on the table and says, I'm out. Nothing else. I take a friend over there with me to scout it and ensure that he actually had left. When we get there, we discover that not only had he left a ton of food and furniture, but he had ripped all of the fire alarms out of the ceilings, he had unscrewed and removed the deadbolt to the front door, and left them lined up neatly on the front table. We then realized that my front door can only lock by using a key from the outside, and it had been locked when we arrived, meaning Kyle still had a key. We called a locksmith immediately. Even after changing the locks, I was still terrified to stay there alone afterwards and never went to sleep at night without barricading the doors with chairs and other furniture. To this day, I still fear for his safety. He was obviously psychologically unstable, but also wonder what could have happened if I hadn't been as lucky as I was. Our official merch store is finally here. If you want to support more of our channel, check out our merch shop. The link is in the description down below. See you on the next video.